love the idea of a self-managed organization. How badly can it go wrong? <laughs> you, can hope. you can lose your business. <laughs> that's pretty bad. Um, that's, that's pretty bad. Like, um, if you don't organize it well, and you don't develop the skills in the people, and you, you don't fully stand behind it, then, you're not, then it's not going to work. Right? It needs to be something that is actually a designed thing, that is actually um, carefully thought through, and is on the one hand managed well enough by everyone in order to be successful, but also uh, open enough to be open for change if change is needed as well. So, some of the things that you talked about were really useful because most startups, what you'll find is you're going through that rapid period of everybody's in the same room as you, and then you start to have to walk further to actually find out who the people are that you need to deal with and then get more and more complex. What would you say in terms of, is it easier to design that process from the start with a well-funded team rather than to make the transition from a typical organization and try to migrate it over to a self-managed team? I think there are advantages and disadvantages associated with both, right? So it's, in a perfect world, you would design it from the beginning and then recruit the right people that have the abilities and have the uh, preconditions in order to fill it well. Um, and, and you don't have to retrain people or let go of people who are not capable of working in that way. So in that sense, it, it might be better to do it before you grow to a degree where you have to completely reconsider how to do it. On the other hand, when you have an existing organization that is already working and you run into <coughs> constant problems, you have more collective problem awareness that is a really motivating thing to, to change something as well. But so it, it can be hard to do the right thing if you are not aware of the problems you may encounter in the future, so you may not get everybody as excited about it as if you are actually solving a problem that everybody is frustrated with. But in the, in the ideal world, you would design your organizational structure or you would design your processes beforehand and then recruit people accordingly to fit within that self-organized, self-managed paradigm that you are planning for. Okay, thanks. Uh, Philip, quick question for you. We'll, we'll come back to the services. Or, so Philip, uh, you talked about the process and it was very interesting because effectively you've done some high-end research. You made an innovative link and most of your presentation was about IP, intellectual property rights and protecting that. So just as a, a ballpark figure, how long did it take in terms of that process to get your patent and approximately what amount of money and effort did that occupy? Basically, we are just at the beginning of the uh, buy, uh, buy paying process. So, uh, we invested, investigated one year of a lot of thinking, <clears throat> and one year of money burning, like uh, doing stuff that someone had to pay for, so we could validate uh, our ideas. <clears throat> and then, after we saw that things are working well in the lab, and we know how to make them work in the lab, then we started to talk to the patent attorney who would help us write this as a patent application and uh, we, we didn't get the patent granted yet, we just uh, <coughs> filed it so actually the big pain for the patent rights is ahead of us uh, but in the process uh, up to now costs about half a million Polish zloty which just the, uh, the invoice that we have to pay to the patent attorney is 10% of that the other part is like buying stuff, paying for the people like, so. and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, if, if we are about to move forward, this is just a small uh, percentage of what is ahead of us when it comes to costs. So just, just, just the, the, the invoice that we have to the patent attorney is about uh, 50,000 zloty. So that's, and that's not for the patent rights for many years, that's just to help us write so many papers with you know, words. 
Yes, that's like basically what, what, what is the end result of the war. <laughs> but the, this is what gives us protection, hopefully in the future, right? So. Okay, and to the man to your right, who happens to be a lawyer, uh, what do people normally mess up with in terms of patent applications? Or what, are, what, what would the guidelines be? You know, because clearly your idea is something that you've made an innovative leap. But there's lots of people out there who can look at it and reverse engineer it. So how important is that patent for somebody like that? And where are the mistakes that people tend to make? So if you were, if a company or somebody came to you and they were doing something within hardware, what advice would you be giving to them now in terms of mapping out that process? Right. Well, to be honest, I'm not an audience attorney, so I am not dealing with patents so too much. In general, uh, it, it, it happens that uh, someone wants to steal your product, wants to uh, steal uh, your idea, uh, then, well, first you have to notify the uh, person that infringes your rights and then try to contact the uh, patent attorney. Like uh, Philip said, it's the best uh, to contact uh, the patent attorney that deals with the issues that it's uh, he or she is experienced at and that he or she can do it uh, the best as can, as he or she can. But the patent attorney deals mostly with filings and uh, if someone wants to breach your patent, then probably the spotting attorney will lead you to a lawyer which is experienced in defending your patents. But Polish law and uh, European law is very strict about um, breaching patents, so we have all the rights to stop this infringement. Okay, so we have Behal here at the back, and Behal is going to have you a question? Yep, and then we have first question for Bastian. Uh, so, I would ask you two things about the organic uh, organization. Uh, so, one is, uh, how do you motivate people? I mean, uh, if they cannot expect they are going to be promoted to manager one day or get a rise, uh, how do you motivate them? Another separate question is, uh, does the, organis uh, the organic organization increase the risk that your employees decide that, well, the founder isn't really needed there, so we just quit and make the same company, but without his other <laughs> that we have to pay? Yes. Um. <laughs> when did answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how most organic organizations manage to motivate their employees is through the purpose of the organization. So if, if you believe in the stuff that the organization does and that it's incredible and it's amazing and it's necessary and you do something that is important, then you, you don't need to have control of other people in order to, to get something for yourself because you do something that is important and amazing and 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 get satisfaction from that. It's something like Elon Musk, Space, everybody believes in Martin Rockets. Yeah, it's um, you know it's with most really uh, successful companies, you have not only the business model, but you have an actual purpose that the organization has that everyone within the organization stands behind and is excited about. If you have an organization that whose whose purpose is to do something that is not significant for the world, you're not going to find people who are going to invest themselves into it. You're going to find people who are going to want a paycheck and who want uh, a closer parking space to the door uh, in order to feel more important because that's how they get a good feeling about themselves. So yes, um, you need to you don't really have a method of motivation if your organizational purpose is not motivating in itself. The, uh, the question around are the, are the people not going to just say, well, the, the founder is an idiot and we're going to do our own thing. If the founder is an idiot and unnecessary and not adding value to the organization, that's exactly what should happen, right? As a leader of a self-managed organization, you need to constantly show to the members of your organization that you are providing just as much value to the organization as everybody else and if you don't then you shouldn't be there right 
and um, the uh, CEO of that organization that I um, introduced, uh, he actually, every couple of years, puts his position to the vote to the entire the company, and he asks every employee, should I remain CEO of this company? Do I provide value for you, or do I not? And, and they have the freedom to say, no, you don't provide that much value anymore, thank you very much, we'll, we'd rather serve for someone else. But the CEO, in the best case, is, the, is a service provider to the members of the organization. In the, in the best organizations, you have the, the pyramid turned around. So you have the people with, <coughs> who are the most important in the organization are those that do the actual work. And everybody who is removed from the actual work should only be there as a service provider who, to those who do the work and not as a, as a controller or as a leader or as a manager. So that's uh, my answers, I hope they're Okay, we have another question. Hi, uh, one question to Bastian. You said that in the perfect world, you set up the processes and then you will recruit the perfect people who will fulfill those processes. How then this reflect to the self-organizing team while you already have the process and you just need to gather the people who will fulfill that? Is it like that, that this is the work, way of work is already defined? No, the teams find, uh, the, the teams hire their members, right? What you have very often in, in self-managed organizations is that um, you have a very long uh, period of time where a new employee is free to, to leave again if they don't want to work that way, and where the team also can say, yeah, no, you, you don't really fit that well to us. You are not actually the right person for us. So there's a longer period of time to do that. And a, a structure or a process is never set in stone. So when you have new people joining a team and they have a fantastic idea on how to organize work in a way that is better for the organization, they can always bring that forward. And if no one has a principled argument against that, they do it that way. And um, it's, it's more fluid than just do it like this or do it like that. You do it in many different ways. And every organization has done it in different ways. There is no perfect recipe that I can tell you now that will fit for every organization. Each organization, each purpose of each organization, each way of working for each organization will always be different. I would love to get with him. <laughs> because uh, the presentation was brilliant. But oh, okay, yeah. re real life maybe is quite different. And, and I, I was thinking, <laughs> oh, what if I was doing this with my company? And I'm sure that people will be fighting between themselves. Like when you have a hierarchical pyramid organization and then you say, hey guys, now you are all equal. The f I know, I know, I'm sure. But the day one, <laughs> a and B, they're going to be fighting, and A will, lead, will, will go to, John will go to, uh, to Ross and will tell him, look, Ross, you are not working to this, and then Ross will get extremely pissed off, and it will be a fight, and then it will be a big escalation. <laughs> At that, no. Okay. I believe that, is, I'm not the first telling you this, so how, how do you manage, how do you mitigate the change, which maybe the, the end idea is fantastic, because it will, it will have the team bonding, it will be more productive, it will be more trust, but, but, but yeah. Uh, how, how you walk the walk? Well, from my perspective, your assessment that they are going to be fighting is, um, is beautiful. <laughs> because that means that they have actually something to say to each other, right? Every fight is uh, an opportunity to, to come to a better solution, to come to a better idea. If John has all the time thought that Ross is not pulling his weight, and he needs that moment in order to be able to, to say that to him, then something is really wrong in your current organizational structure. Because John should be empowered to tell to Ross, uh, I'm sure they don't exist, but to uh, hypothetically to, maybe they do, uh, to be empowered and have the capacity and have the skills to talk to Ross in a way that is non-threatening and actually constructive and productive. If the members in the organization don't have the skills to communicate with each other in a way that is constructive, productive, leading towards a joint purpose, then 
then that's the problem, not the organization structure that you have around it. What you, in a pyramid structure that maybe you currently have, what you avoid is, um, is people taking responsibility for themselves and for each other because they delegate that responsibility to someone else, right? What you have in a self-managed organization is people actually being responsible for themselves and for their work and accountable not only to their manager who's giving them a performance appraisal once a year, but to their peers who are empowered to give them a performance appraisal every day through ways that are actually useful and productive. When you have um, the metaphor that I often use for feedback is that of a cook, because I'm a cook. But um, what really good chefs have is at their station a little cup with spoons inside, right? And what they do as they cook a dish is that they take a clean spoon, they tap it into the sauce, for example, and they feed themselves back the results of their decisions and behavior. And based on that, they make decisions what they need to do differently. Feedback is exactly that. Feedback gives you an insight into someone else's experience of your work. And based on that, you can make decisions on what to do more of or less of. That is what feedback should be. And if everybody in the team is capable of being that spoon to everybody else in that team and has the ability to share with them their insights into how they are doing, then everybody has the potential to get much better at what they are doing. Ross is not getting better because John is not telling Ross what he thinks Ross could be doing better. So everybody stays way below their potential because they have not the, um, either the space or the empowerment or the structure to support each other in getting better. So everybody stays below their potential. And that is what you have in pyramid organizations. Everybody does what they are told to, be do, told to do, but not everybody does what, at the end of the day, should be happening in order to get to the highest possible, possible potential of the team, of the organization, of the purpose of the organization. And that is what you lack, or that is what you miss out of if you don't let people fight in a competent way. And that is what the difference is. In pyramid organizations, we don't assume communication competence by everybody in the team. Because we also don't invest in them, right? We don't consider the interpersonal skills of everybody in the team as vital as the technical skills of everybody in the team. So we make sure we hire people who are really good at what they're doing, and we ignore, very often, are they really good at being a great colleague? And and that you, um, you lose out on a lot of potential because everybody gets a lot better when they are being challenged, not only by the manager, but by everybody. Yeah. I would like to urge you to ask questions to all of the followers. <laughs> it's like, it's like, like I, I, love, I, love, I, I like to hear what you say, but uh, we have six different, I would, uh, be uh, actually in a minute. We have six people here, counting them. Seven. Yeah. <laughs> Seven. Six and a half. Congratulations. And, <laughs> and all of them have different um, him, points of view about the same stuff. And we can ask questions to all of the, all, to all of the panelists regarding uh, our everyday problems, right? So let's ask a question. Business problems. Not everyday problems. Uh, business problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like me doing only business, so it's my everyday problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, so business problems. We can uh, we can ask questions and we can all share uh, the point of view. And you can also give can... great parenting advice if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for example. Uh, so yeah, a question to to feed probably to others uh, as well. Um, during your presentation, you mentioned about. Uh, the SMT CEO and, and some uh, VCs that you have uh, gained some funding from. Um, probably many people here, uh, they are in a front of uh, investment decisions uh, because of the businesses that they want to set up. So what would be the you know, main things that you would like to advise to people that are talking to investors, needs to uh, close the 
let's say, first round of uh, investment and, and this kind of, uh, you know, takeaways that you have learned along uh, those two years that you mentioned. Okay, so probably we all can share. I would like to add maybe each panelist could answer this question. So, the, the, uh, my perspective is that, um, first of all, what the people are looking at is, is about your commitment. So, in my world as a scientist, I see many people who try to stay in academia and do a startup company at the same time. And I think this is uh, maybe true also for other sectors. So the investors, they, they, they are more open to talk to you if they feel that you really invested yourself in this idea because then if it's worth investing your life, then probably they, they want to hear about it. If, if you're just like, I kind of try it and then, but just one fifth of my time, then, then probably this is not the best way to show it. Then the nice people that I met during this investors meetings or investors interview, uh, they really are really interested in you as a person, I think. So they want to trust you, so you want to be yourself. And uh, if this makes them comfortable with you, then I think this, this is already a good connection. So don't try to pretend something else, but, uh, but also be, be, uh, respect their time, come prepared, think about what you want to say, don't, don't make them uh, work, do the work for you. You, you, you want to, you know, the their, 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 their time, their, their opinion. So really think about what is important to say, what you can leave for later. Don't overload them with the information. I think this is like on the, the personal level because investors, I thought, thought about them as a, some kind of organizations, but at the end of the day, these are people and you, you want to build a relationship. So these are more my, let's say, on the personal level things. Yeah. I don't want to say something. Um, just from, from the marketing side of, um, of things too, make sure you do research of who are you trying to like get the money from. Um, if, if you go to someone who's wealthy enough to invest in whatever, you know what to do. You just show your passion, show your product, and basically convince the guy that you're the right guy to do this thing. But there are other investors that will actually look for their money back. Like people who are really interested in like, I have 100, I want 200 back. So you need to be prepared on what you want to say and how you want to say it to certain kind of investors. So you can't have the same pitch for everybody. You need to really know who are you going to ask money from. So if you're going to go for a guy who's really looking for their money back, they want to see the numbers. They want to see how much money you're going to bring back from that investment. But all the people, like I said before, all the people will be more interested in like, I really believe in your product and I want to see your product succeed. Because I already have money. I'm not looking for money. I'm just looking for new companies or new technologies to be developed. And I want to see that. So besides like what Philip is right, I mean, you do need to show your passion. You need to show that you know your product better than anyone. You know the pain that you're relieving, and you like you're willing to jump on the bridge for your product. When you get that cover, then you you know exactly what to say to different kind of people that you're going to be willing to put money on. So on my advice will be do the research who are you selling this to. I, I don't have a startup, but I, I love podcasts. And there is one podcast that I can really recommend. It's called Startup uh, by Gimlet Media. And it's basically, a, it's now starting its third season, like yesterday. But the first season is really, really interesting because it is a documentary on starting the company with all the highs and the lows and the doubts and the really, really bad investor um, conversations and then really good investor conversations. And it's a really honest and inside view on uh, starting a, a company in, in the startup environment. So if you, if you like stories and, uh, and you have a phone that has a podcast app, then uh, I, I can really recommend it. It's really, uh, really well done. Just, just a quick one. Uh, it's a quick joke. Do you know how um, startup owners sleep? Like babies. They wake up every four hours crying. <laughs> <laughs> it's true for two and a half year olds still. <laughs> from my perspective, I deal with business angels transactions like from legal point of view. And I know that Polish entrepreneurs, Polish, Polish business angels, don't want to share risks, uh, especially business risks. So 
uh, if a business angel approach to me and say, I want an investment agreement with a startup, please draft an agreement. And if you don't agree with the business angel that some risk can be shared, he will come to me and say, make as severe agreement as possible, then we will negotiate with the founder and we will see what happens. So I would advise you that you should meet the VC or business angel and uh, agree with him beforehand that some risk you don't want to share, like business risk. So um, I, draft, uh, I drafted some investment agreements that would kill you and uh, make some contractual penalties uh, just if your business don't perform well. And I think uh, it's good to um, agree with the investor that uh, you shouldn't have any problems if the business fails. So only if you don't perform some duties as a manager or as a founder or as a um, shareholder, then maybe he can uh, claim some damages. But uh, business issues should be out of your uh, responsibility and obligations uh, as a uh, founder. I mean, of course, it's your obligation. It's your, it is in your interest to have this business uh, doing well. But if something goes wrong, then you shouldn't be uh, obliged to pay anything to the investor. And she's up? And two quick things. Um, Adobe, um, the number one in business angel that we all should have is our future customers. Uh, if what you are building it has value and it has sense and, and, and your customers believe in you, don't be shy and, and ask them for money. It works. It sounds crazy, but it's not. If it's something good and they understand the value, ask for the customers for the money. This is a do and the don't. <laughs> uh, our experience asking for grants in Poland and in other European countries, not good. <laughs> Maybe some other people got luckier, but typically, what it happens is that you invest a lot more time that money you get back. So from my, my little experience, maybe better talk with friends or customers or business agents. <laughs> okay, so let's assume that you have a good idea. <laughs> and there's real potential. Make sure you don't need the money. So there's always one guy that has what's called the fuck you power. Make sure you're that guy. So if you do what Cesar says, if you go to your customers and if you have income, you don't need the investor. So always try and be in that position. Because I work both sides of the table. The first thing I do if I'm advising investors or I'm putting my own money in, I look and see how quickly that company is going to die. How soon are you going to run out of money? And the quicker that is, the longer my negotiations will go on. <laughs> because you'll be coming and going, I can't meet payroll. I can't meet my mortgage payment. And I'm going to get a better deal. So that's always look at that. But an investor, especially early, should be somebody who is aligned to what you're looking to achieve. If you're going to somebody, and if you're asking them for money, the first thing that you should be able to say is, the reason I am coming to you is because you have this experience or you have access to this market. And if you're not saying that, you should not be in front of that person. Because then you're asking for stupid money. Because it adds no value. So it has to be somebody who can provide access. Access is the most expensive thing that you will get. Go to an investor that owns that market. Go to an investor who can make the deals happen. Do that, you add value. If you don't do that, all you're doing is you're taking money and you're going to burn it. So always look at 
Make sure that you're asking customers for, uh, for money as soon as you can. Because then you turn around and go, I don't need you. We're going to do this anyway. Make sure that you're in a position to pick the investor that adds the value. And look at it almost like a self-managed organization. These people should be aligned with what you're looking to do. So that you're not in, in a, a situation where it's, what if this goes wrong? It's about, okay, the two of us are going to be working together because it is going to be like a marriage. These, especially the early guys, should be some of the most important people that you have. They should be the guys who are opening the doors. They are the guys that should have the experience. And if they don't, walk away. Next question. Hello? Well, I have a question then. Uh, you said that this, uh, this easy money if you don't align with the investor or with clients, right? That's, not, that's also not easy money because you have to pursue the clients to pay you more or in advance to collect cash to grow, for example, right? But what if you cannot? Uh, how can you get money? So then I guess there is a third option. You can have uh, EU money. <coughs> Right? It's not like that. Dotations and more public, public money. Public money. And then you have banks. So if you don't need any investor, you just want to have money. Banks give you money if you don't need it. Yeah. And in Poland, in this local market, the smart investors generally have a rule, which is if you have received EU funding, that they probably won't don't want to do a deal with you. Because an awful lot of the historical EU funding has created handcuffs. So, I don't know if in terms of your experience, or, uh, but, but certainly I know that uh, people that have had funding in the past to do the deal and the amount of time and effort to extract them out of the handcuffs of EU 3.1 funding, it takes three or four times longer. So if you're looking at it from an investment point of view, you're going to do so many days a Say for argument's sake, it's going to be 20. If this deal is going to take three times longer, you need to have three times higher return on investment on that deal than any other deal that you're looking to do. So anything that you're looking to do, talk to the people who have gone down the road before, find out what the obstacles are to overcome, ask for advice, go to somebody who's done it before and say, what do I need to know? What would you do differently? But it's not about easy money. Try and give yourself choice, right? It is like dating, you should not end up with the first investor that you necessarily speak to. You should be making sure that it's a good fit, that the two of you are going to be working in the same direction, that they can provide something to you that's more than just money. That's the follow-up. Okay, great. Other questions? Question. Okay, so, question to Bastian. So, I'm general, I'm not sure if I understand this correctly. This, uh, you know. <coughs> type of organization. However, I can imagine, for example, people shouting in front of each other. And I was thinking about the role of the, not manager, or not the hierarchy, but about the role of the leader. And I've heard so many times that the calls for failure or something like that. It was not that the single leader was chosen. I just wanted to ask how does it work to the role of the leader in this kind of organization? Well, there's, there's a difference between a leader and a manager, right? And uh, the, the way how you can identify your leader is by amount of people following them, not by how badly they want to be a leader. <laughs> Quite often, uh, you have leaders who really want to be a leader, but, and they go somewhere, and then they turn around, and there's no one there. They are not leaders. Leaders are the, the most inspiring leaders, those that gather the most people behind them or people who are really inspired to do something and they can articulate that and they can speak about that and they can uh, they are genuinely and authentically excited about it and then suddenly they look behind and there's a bunch of people behind them who are who have been following them even though they uh, you know that was never their primary motivation so in each of these organizations you have formal leaders and informal leaders but what what you don't often have is a, a formal authority system between leaders and, um, and people who they are leading. Is that 
a leader always has to um, have a good argument of why something is necessary and then people choose to do it that way because it makes sense to do it that way. So for, for example, this, uh, again, this organization that I've been introducing, they have um, uh, an engineer and the role of the engineer is to encourage the different teams to, to look at what they are doing and to learn from each other and to, to gather best practices and to, to share them across the different teams so that they make sure that no one in the organization has some great innovation on how to do something that the other teams are not benefiting from. However, that engineer cannot tell any team to implement any of the, of the ideas that other teams have. All that person can do is make them genuinely excited about them about that idea and then get them to implement it because they choose to implement it. And I'm not sure that answers your question at all, but uh, the, the role of a leader in an organization like that is literally to lead and not to, um, to control. Does that make sense? Right, so we have one more question. Yeah, a quick one for our Tony Stark. What was first, the idea or the technology? You mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know who Tony Stark is? No, probably. Nice. <laughs> 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 so I should be flattered, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 so the question was, <laughs> sorry, idea what com com What was, was the first, the idea, the idea or the technology? Okay. Um, so I guess me, uh, I, I was understanding the with my. 15 years of experience in uh, making solar cells uh, and different research projects, I was understanding the trends in technology. So well, I was understanding uh, what would be necessary to make some some progress. And then, then if you have an idea, and the idea connected with a possible application of the idea, so you have an idea and then you think where I could put it, how does it fit somewhere, somewhere where I feel it could really fit in, then, then I think th this is the match. So, so, the, so th the first thing was an idea with the understanding of what kind of problem this idea could solve. And then it took me one year of my life to, um, uh, let's say, in the evenings, read the papers, try to think, how, could this idea really work in the lab? And then if I would start testing the idea in the research institution that I was employed, then anything that would happen afterwards would not belong to me. So the, the intellectual property would belong to the research organization. So I, I was really careful not to, to do any tests, but if I want to do any tests, then I need the money. So uh, to do it independently, to quit the job. And, and so the, the idea was that it, 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 it was growing and, and it was like on the paperwork, I tried to test it, try to talk to people. And at the same time, you, you have the struggle inside of yourself. Do I want to invest my energy, my lifetime, my, my whatever, resources that I have in trying to make it really uh, uh, experimentally tested and, uh, and, 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 and yeah and it took me one year like to make this place in my head to try to find this new structure uh, and, and, and I even I mean, maybe that's too personal but I uh, I'm not ashamed of that so I was really uh, even working with a coach like a personal coach who would like meet me every now and then and I would talk to him about like because Doing science is different than doing business, and then if you're good at one, it doesn't really mean that you would be good at the other thing, and and you, you need different uh, um, uh, qualities, I guess, uh, to be successful in the business world, and you need in the scientific world. So, so the first was idea, then there was a lot of um, uh, <coughs> emotions, and then and then and we started to test the technology. So probably this this yeah. this is the short answer. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, I have a question then of you. Uh, I have a very big team, about 40 people, and all of them are meeting uh, on the Facebook because all of them work remotely from all over the planet and Europe. And sometimes I see that emotions in this discussion is very, very bad. It's leading to the argument. And as a leader, what should I do? And when should I catch the moment to mm, do something, stop the bad emotions and not to let the team 
um, just broke. And uh, maybe do you have any um, similar story to, to, to show me how you reacted to such a situation? I just want to say, um, I think you need to think if this 40 people needs to get together all the time and give them all the freedom to talk to each other. I mean, I know it goes a little bit against what Bassin was saying as a, as a self-managing organization, but um, also what he said about having a leader, that someone that leads the conversation in the right way, it could help out not to mix this team talking crap about this team or getting really emotional about some subject that 20 people on the team is not even involved and they're just getting the bad emotions from this other team that's dealing with something that is not their business. So maybe leading those conversations of 40 people in a way that we're going to talk about this, this and that and I want you guys to be lead this conversation, you guys listen to this conversation, and then we can discuss in a different way. And instead of giving all the freedom, okay, let's, let's all meet in Facebook, let's all meet in this platform, and let's talk. And if you give the freedom to everybody to talk, you're going to get to that point anyway, because there are people that are more passionate about things than others. But if you lead that in a good way, like, all right, look, this is how we're going to do it, you probably have more control over how how the team and how the people relate. I mean, if there's someone really passionate and you want to let them talk, let them talk, but then you get involved and refocus the conversation. Okay, I understand, I understand your anger, I understand your happiness, whatever. Now we're taking it this way. Let me go back to this subject. Well, just, it, it, I think it will be more, it will be better to lead it in a way that all these people can talk, but with someone as a kind of a mediator. My advice would be to provide some rules of, <laughs> of communication. Like do's and don'ts. Do say please, thank you, and so forth. And don't shout, don't say the words uh, to your colleagues. And maybe provide some penalties uh, if someone pushes those rules. So I think that would be my advice as a leader, to provide certain rules of communication of people that are involved discussion. <laughs> uh, do you sometimes get together physically in the same space? Or are you always remote? Yeah, we are always remote. Yeah. Okay. So um, that makes it a bit more complicated. But what I would suggest is um, a, a dedicated time and space where everybody actually talks about how they're going to work with each other. Because quite often we always talk about something, but we never talk about how we are going to talk and how we are going to solve certain problems and how we are going to, um, to give ourselves these rules. I, whenever you give rules from above to say, okay, no all caps. And, and no uh, swear words, and no blah, 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 blah. These things are still going to happen, but maybe they will happen in a private, private group on Facebook where not, you're not invited anymore, <laughs> right? Because they will, everybody always finds a way to, to do what they think is the logical thing to do. So to, to bring it to the meta level and to say, okay, at this time, we're going to have a meeting, a company-wide meeting, but we're not going to talk about any company business. We're only going to talk about how we are going to work together. And we are going to give dedicated spaces to uh, where everybody can put a topic forward of what they would like to talk about, how they're going to talk with each other, and to, to facilitate that. To not just say, okay, let's meet and talk about how we're going to talk about it, but to give a facilitated structure, and there's many different methods to do that, right? There is, there's open space, there's um, uh, appreciative inquiry, there's many different formats how you can do that, but uh, to, to do that, to be conscious about how you're going to work and then consciously do that process. Thank you. Okay, a couple, couple of very, very quick ones. Actually, it's one of the things that Bastian said there is the difference between people's technical competence and how they can work within a group. And I think one of the struggles that startups have is that you don't have funds, you don't have the influence to attract people, 
until you get to a certain level, people are looking at you going, who are you? So you're competing. Like I'm sure you've had the situation feel like that you're trying to attract people on board and unless they buy into the big idea, then they're going to be offered salaries from some of the big multinational corporations that's guaranteed that you know it's got pension plans and all that other security and it's hard to attract people. But in, I've had two situations where in, in the startups that I've got involved with, I've had extremely good people at what they do. One was uh, an initial CTO and the other was our head of sales in two different companies all together. And both of them were extremely negative people. And although if you looked at them in isolation in terms of their own performance, it was superb, but if you looked at the impact that they had on all the other people around them, they just sucked the energy. Everything was no. Everything was, that's crap. That doesn't work. And the overall impact that they had was massively negative. So I think one, as, as somebody who's trying to lead a group, you need to look at people and make sure that you're saying, we have one goal and we're working towards one solution. And unless you're coming forward with something positive and saying how we can do things better, we don't want you involved in the project. So I, I think that you know we need to take a step back, realign people, that probably needs to be one of the biggest things that you need to do in terms of buy-in. And then from there, you can you know, start to look at the things that uh, Bastien suggested in terms of the rules and the guidance and how that environment works. But if people are negative, and if they're, they're always saying, you can't do this, and are putting up obstacles, and are complaining, I would probably try and remove them. And that's, I think, one of the big problems that people have. It's, you think that, uh, just because this person has that technical competence that you have a dependency. People who are negative, doesn't matter. I, I, I would always you know, try and, and move them and, and explain and, and re-engage them again. But if that's not happening, goodbye. Question, if you have a positive person, but doesn't, that person doesn't have skills you need, do you invest time in training? If they have the brain, if they have the commitment, I, I would always, always go for, as long as the people are smart enough not to make the same mistakes. If people are making the same mistakes over and over again, bye. But otherwise, I would always take uh, people who have the willingness to learn over somebody who has the skill sets and, and a negative. Because almost every job that we are working on, so most people are going to be if you're involved in IT, the IT that you're using now is going to be very different to even five years ago. Like the first thing I learned to program in was Fortran and Pascal, and probably nobody in the room has ever even seen a line of code in that stuff. <laughs> oh well, done. <laughs> oh, good. I suddenly do not feel as old. Okay, but uh, you know the skill sets constantly change, constantly evolve. If people are enthusiastic, if they want to do the research, if they want to put the time and effort, and if they are prepared to invest in themselves, then I would always give them a chance. You know, Philip's an example of that. He was sitting there doing all of this in his spare time. He spent a long amount of time when he could be doing other things. You know, spent time with with his with his family, spent time doing lots of other much more interesting things and reading scientific journals. If people are prepared to invest in themselves, I, I would always go for that. But just make sure they don't make expensive mistakes for a start and uh, make sure that they will take out if people are trainable and if they want to learn yeah um, sorry guys we are <laughs> 20 minutes uh, can we go, go talk to him now okay yeah <laughs> that works better so uh, i would like to thank the panel and uh, that was for discussion.